This is the Victory Podcast, and I'm your host, Steve McGrath. Welcome back, everyone. This week, I am pleased from my new studio, which I got to work on the lighting in the background a little bit. But from my new studio, I am pleased to bring you this week's guest. It is Mr. Josh Hull, a man who, after his four-year career in the NFL, went on to get his MBA and found Contend Consulting, which he gives you his contact information. So if you stick around to the end of the podcast, you can figure out how to reach him. But Josh spent five years at Penn State. He was a walk-on playing linebacker with the likes of Paul Puzlesny, Navarro Bowman, Sean Lee. And this man went from maybe never even getting on the field to being a starter and getting drafted. His story is one of the coolest. I'm so happy that he took the time to break it down for us. But before we get into the meat of that, you know I have to remind you guys that we're brought to you by Team Builder. And Team Builder provides strength and conditioning software to more than 500 high school football programs nationwide, as well as the NFL. So whether you write your own programs, you have a full-time strength coach, or you need training programs, Team Builder can make your weight room more efficient, more accountable, and smarter when it comes to measuring your team's progress. So go to teambuilder.com, use the promo code VICTORY, and you're going to get a nice cool gift. Now, without any further ado, here is our conversation with Josh Hull. Two, one, boom. On the line, we have Josh Hull. Josh, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing good, gentlemen. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. Appreciate you joining us. Yeah, awesome. Now, we were talking off air before we started here about Penn State and the glory days. And from your time there, 2005 to 2009, I don't know if there was a better five-year period in Penn State history. You know, you, you start off being number one, bad years. You guys were ranked number 25, and then you finish your career there with, you know, two great seasons. Uh, you, you were ranked, like, number eight, you know, just a, a two-loss year both years. When you, when you look back, right, it, I don't think you could have imagined it could have gone any better, but you were also so close, so close so many times to being that number one team. I mean, when you just look at your overall experience at Penn State and the success you had there, you know, what are your thoughts about what that was like? Yeah, it was, uh, it was second to none to be able to go up there and play in front of 110,000 people every single week uh, to get coached by arguably the best coach in college football, Coach Paterno. Um, and play with with five star recruits every single day. I was uh, I was a walk on coming out of high school, so it was uh, it was a stretch for me to even be able to step foot on the field. And when I was finally able to kind of crack that, that lineup, it was a major breakthrough for myself. And just um, I learned a lot through that process. We can kind of get into that a little bit later. But a really biggest I learned is underestimate yourself because you don't really know how much you can accomplish until you're really until your back is truly put against the wall. And for me, um, I had zero stars coming out of high school. So my back was literally against the wall every single day up there. But it was an awesome experience. And it was the uh, best five years of my life playing football. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was awesome. And you hit the nail right on the head with, you know, you're, you're pretty much a local guy. I don't know how far you were from Happy Valley in high school, but can you just walk us through what that decision was like, where you wanted to go to school? Did Penn State give you any sort of promise? Like, well, you're a preferred walk-on? Like, how did that all come together for you? Yeah, I just uh, – I literally just got goosebumps. So every time somebody asks me that question, I relive it. It's, it's super, super vivid in my mind. So, uh, yeah, that process, I started going to summer camps at Penn State my junior year, uh, working with Coach Vanderlyn in one-on-one. Um, went back my senior year, the summer of my senior year. Uh, kind of put us in a group of three or four guys of other linebackers that they were considering signing at the same time. Uh, Jerome Hayes was one of them from Bayonne, New Jersey. Um, Jerome's a really good guy. I was, I was pretty good friends with him throughout my entire Penn State career. Kind of just morphed that. I, I battled and fought throughout that whole um, summer camp program. And at the end of that, Coach Vanderlyn and offered me a preferred walk-on spot. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it happened. And, and once you had that offer, it was just sort of everything else was done. Did you look at any other route? Um, in my mind, it was absolutely done. Um, I still, I still took advantage of taking the recruiting trips because that's a, that's an experience in and of itself as well. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool to go to be an 18 year old kid and basically get wined and dined like a King at all these schools all over the United States, trying to, uh, 
to seal the deal with you. But I, my recruiting experience was a little bit mild compared to a lot of the other guys at Penn State. Um, I took a trip to William & Mary, and I took a tr trip to Bucknell. Um, so I didn't have any other big-time big, big -time Division I programs. I uh, was very, very close to going to Bucknell University. Um, and this is, this is a story I like to share every time I talk about this because it kind of lit a, uh, a fire underneath me for my future success. So we go through this whole process and meet with all the coaches, and you have lobster and steak dinners, and you go into the locker room, and they have a Bucknell jersey with my last name on it. And they're making all these empty promises just like every other coach does to a, <laughs> to a high schooler. Uh, the, final, the last day, I think it was like a Saturday when the trip was wrapping up, uh, my mom and dad were with me. The coach comes out to me and said, Josh, he said, I, I will never forget these words the rest of my life. These are words that kind of, they've stuck with me my entire life. Um, he said, Josh, you can come to Bucknell and make a, you can make an impact immediately. You'll come in here and probably start as a freshman. You'll pay four years and have an opportunity to play a lot of football. Um, he said, I understand that you're also considering going to Penn State. Is that, is that true, young man? I said, yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to go to Penn State. It's, it's in my backyard there. They're definitely on my list. He's like, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, if you go up to Penn State, you're going to be a very small fish in a very large sea. And that kind of – that coach had the audacity to say it to me. I kind of looked at my dad, and my dad kind of looked at me. And we didn't have to say a single word, but we were on the same – we were on the exact same page. And I couldn't, I couldn't tell you one word that that coach told me after that phrase came out of his mouth because I completely shut every, everything out. I, I knew for a fact I was not going to Bucknell University. Yeah, as a competitor, you have to shut that off, right? Because you can't let that get in your brain. Because, yeah. you know, especially as a recruiting coach, that's probably the worst thing you could tell a kid, too, is when you're trying to get them to go there. Absolutely. And you, you hit the, you struck a nail right on the head there with the competition portion of it. I, the type of person I am, I mean, competition is knitted in my thread and who I am as a person. So to go somewhere and not have to compete for a starting position was completely foreign to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that I did not want to entertain. Um, I wanted to go to Penn State and compete with the best kids in the nation every single day. And it essentially turned me into the best football player that I could possibly be at the college level because I had to elevate my play uh, on a day-to-day -day basis just to hang with these guys uh, in, in seven-on-seven -seven drills and summer workouts. Every single thing that I did, um, I could never let my guard down because everybody I was competing with, competing against was bigger than me and faster than me. Yeah, what's the term? Iron sharpening iron, right? It's just good Absolutely. against good, and you're not, yeah, you're not going in there expecting anything. You're going in there to work. So yeah. that, that is an interesting story, that, especially from a recruiting standpoint, that they just tell you that because you I, usually feel the kid out, right? It's like, all right, this kid's a competitor. I want him to come in and compete. This kid, yeah. sometimes you have to be like, hey, you'll start. You'll get a spot, and they'll right. light the, a fire up under him. So I'm shocked he wasn't able to feel you out a little bit and tell you the things you wanted to hear and not, what you didn't want to hear right I've told this story enough times I know one of these days that coach is going to call me and apologize I'm waiting for it that's why I'm, I'm just saying I want to keep telling this story as much as I can because I, I know one of these days my phone's gonna ring I'm gonna get an email and say hey man I really made a big mistake and congratulations on the career that you had because you did pretty good <laughs> oh man well challenge accepted let's get this out there <laughs> uh, now iron sharpens iron you've talked about it but just a couple names Navarro Bowman Sean Lee Paul Puzlesny. I'm pretty sure Penn State has always been linebacker you, but I mean, like you played in just the perfect era of just absolute savages on the field. And you're part of that great tradition. What's in the water in Happy Valley? How are, are these freaks coming out of there, yourself included? Like, what is it about that room that's just producing these top level guys, guys like zero stars, guys that are five stars, anywhere in between? They're just tackling machines. What's going on? Yeah, it's, I think it comes down to the process that Coach Vanderlyn had implemented uh, day in and day out. Um, he was a stickler on technique. He was a technician. So if you, if you couldn't prove to him that you couldn't get lined up in the right spot and couldn't take this, the right footwork to get to where you needed to be, um, you couldn't, if you couldn't put in, have an inside hand placement, if you couldn't shock and shed blocks, if you couldn't play the pass, I mean, these were little things that you had to do on a day-to-day -day basis at practice. And if you couldn't do it at practice, there was no chance you were getting an opportunity to do it at Beaver Stadium. So he just, I think Coach, Coach Vanderlyn and, um, really took care of the little things. And he knew that if he could take care of the little things from a linebacker perspective, the big things would take care of themselves. Um, and the, the, uh, to, to stay on the theme of iron sharpens iron as well, that room <laughs> every single year had the four or five top linebackers in all of the United States. So that, that's another thing you have to factor into the success that Penn State has in the tradition, tradition at linebacker U. Um, 
Yeah, occasionally you can get a great, great linebacker surrounded with some mediocre players. But when you have five, six, seven, eight great players in one room, you elevate one another to, to a level that is truly unfathomable when you don't have to compete with kids like that on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and if you have a coach pushing those guys too, I mean, it only makes them better, right? It only makes them, especially the room, making the room better itself. I had a question here too about just getting more technical and adding on to what you said about being a technician in the process. Uh, how much did reading, studying line assignments, I mean, you mentioned you're a Dean's List guy, like, you know, were Sean Lee and those other guys too, were they so ingrained in the game of actually reading and studying the opponent? Uh, what kind of things went into that room of uh, – you know, getting the eyes right before they get their feet right to make sure that they're uh, able to press the line of scrimmage and actually make tackles in and behind the uh, line of scrimmage. Yeah, you, you have to be a student of the game. Um, even at the college level to succeed, it's a, it's a necessity. If you're not a student of the game, you're good. There's a, I shouldn't say that. There's a couple, couple of super, super, super talented guys that can get away with it without being students of the game. But the majority of the guys at Penn State, we really, uh, we really took passion in, in our craft. And that, that involved – um, film study involved um, studying our competitors one on one on a player to player basis. So if we have a couple blitz packages in that we're rushing against the left tackle, we're going to sit down and dissect the left tackle and kind of figure out where his weaknesses were on how we could beat him off the edge. Um, the, the film study is kind of a, we could almost take that into another complete discussion um, in and of itself. Um, everything is broken down into categories um, when we were at Penn State, and I think a lot of – I know a lot of the pro teams do it as well because I did it when I was uh, with the teams so with St. Louis, the Redskins, uh, Patriots, Jaguars, et cetera. So it's all broken down by personnel. Um, each each offensive formation has a personnel grouping, and then it's also broken down by down and distance, and then it's broken down by um, locations on the field. So you could literally go through um, our film platform and our film software and choose – specific situations locations on the field down distance and personnel groupings and that's kind of how we watched and dissected film so at any point on the field if it was a third down if it was a third and long situation and you knew you were on the opponent's 30 yard line your mind would just rack during the game all right here's the here's some of the formations that they run and here's the pass patterns that came out of it so it just allowed you to play a lot faster when you got on um, got onto the field and that was something for me, um, there was a major learning curve for me from going from high school to college, and that was the film study portion of it. I really didn't start to click to my junior and senior year. I was so concerned about just learning the scheme of the defense and worrying about where I needed to be lined up that the film study – I still did film study at the young age, but I wasn't really able to use that as an advantage in a game till my junior and senior year when everything started to slow down a little bit for me. Sure, and I think that's probably the biggest mental hurdle, right, as a kid going from high school to – I'm not sure how big your high school was, but then going to a top tier division one program like Penn state. I I find that interesting though. And I think, you know, I coach at high school too. I find that's when you can ease the player's mind when you go into personnel down distance location on the field. Okay. They're left hash 21 personnel and it's third and eight. I know they like to run bing bing. So now I play play fast from there. Right. And I think that's probably, you know, the, the key of my question was, was like being able to play fast at a fast rate because you don't have to think so much. You can just go and play ball, which is the best football to be played. Yeah, absolutely. And the only, the only true way um, that you can kind of get to that point to play fast and just basically react and not think is to have experience and to take reps mm-hmm. at, at a young age. Man, I was so concerned about as an inside linebacker, um, you're calling the defense, you're setting the fronts, you're communicating coverage to the secondary um, there's a lot of stuff going on. And then, oh, yeah, on top of that, I got to worry about getting lined up in the right spot. So as a youngster, man, your head is just like – it is going a thousand different places in, in, in a fraction of a second. And you, I really had no time whatsoever to even start thinking about <laughs> the film study that I had. But as the game slows down and the more reps you take, um, you can really, really, really um, be super, super efficient with anticipating where the plays are going to be and what, what you're going to do. Navarro, Navarro Bowman was a master at that. Uh, in college he just had a knack for a real knack and a true intuition of what was going to happen and he used to he used to communicate back and forth with Sean and I it's like hey man it's coming my way I don't know why but it's coming this way and they'd set out the ball and it was coming right to him and he, and it, he was like 90 percent maybe that's an exaggeration but he was really really good just had a feel for kind of the flow of the game and and Sean um, Sean is also a master he was he was the brainiac the kid knows more about football than I probably have forgotten about. I mean, he, he's, <laughs> he's above and beyond in a league of his own. That's why he's still playing right now. Mm. Um, he know, literally knows what all 11 guys on the field 
do it every single time. He knows where he needs to be. He knows where uh, – it's it's unfathomable, his knowledge of, of football. He has literally has a Ph.D. mind in football. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy, right, because everyone says Tom Brady. He's done it for so long that he's seen everything. On the flip side, when you get to Sean Lee's level, when you have the talent and you've been doing it for so long, he's also seen everything. So you just get to a point where you just get that level of veteran and talent, and it's just a battle of the minds now. It's almost not even physical. It's just they're playing chess the entire game. Um, But, you know, just speaking of Sean, can you just walk us through what 2008 was like for you? Because he gets hurt before the season starts. And he, of course, has all, you know, the – not that it's uh, not deserved, but he's the one that's getting all the attention, the spotlight. You know, he's, you know, the face of linebackers at that time. Mm-hmm. You're the guy that goes and fills the void. And, I mean, you do it to the tune of, like, being a, a star on defense. But what was it like for you, a young man, you were a walk-on, you're just trying to get your feet under you, and then boom – now you're the guy everyone's turning to that you have to fill this void. How did you just sort of – you can't swim until you're in the water, but what did you do until you act to get yourself ready for that moment? Yeah, to start off, there was a bunch of questions there. To start off, I mean, all the attention that Sean was getting um, prior to that season, it was 100% deserved. Um, the kid worked harder than any other person at Penn State that I can even imagine. Um, there was a reason he was had the accolades and there was a reason he was getting all the attention. So I, it, it would be unfair to Sean if I didn't say that. Um, the kid deserved every every little bit of attention he got. And then the second portion of that, um, I was devastated when Sean got hurt. Um, Sean and I were very, very close at Penn State. Um, we lived together. We were roommates. We trained together. Um, we worked out together. We dieted together. Um, conditioned literally everything that we did. Or everything that, that – <laughs> I was with him and that, that wasn't by accident either. Um, I knew, <laughs> I knew the type of kid that he was. And I knew the caliber that he played at and on a consistent basis. And I knew it was kind of one of my mental goals that was undisclosed that I wanted to try to get as close to him as possible from a get go to learn as much as I possibly could from him. Uh, hopefully that some of that knowledge and some of that, uh, that intuition would rub off on me. So, and it worked, we became really, really good friends and it was, it's the iron sharpens iron theory. Uh, and theme just kind of coming to the surface again that I made him better and he made me better. We just bounced back and forth uh, our entire career there at Penn State. Um, for me, it was, uh, I think now the third question might have been, how did I prepare for that situation? Um, as a walk-on, going in, going in as a walk-on at Penn State, um, I knew that there was a chance that I could have an opportunity to play. And I also knew that there was a really good chance that I may never, ever have an opportunity to step on the field. Um, I couldn't control the opportunity, but the thing that I could control was my preparation um, prior to the opportunity. So yeah, it was enormous shoes to fill when Sean went down, but I also did everything that I could do from an individual level and a personal perspective to be ready for that opportunity when it arose. Um, it was, uh, it was baptism by fire. I think a lot of it, it was kind of like drinking, trying to drink out of a fire hose is another good analogy. Um, but it's one of those things you don't, you don't learn it till you do it. And I got out on the field and I did it. Um, felt good one one game and in the second game it felt a little better and it just, just kind of kept feeling better and next thing you know I'm anticipating and I'm reacting and um, double digit tackles week in week out and it's just kind of uh, one thing led to the other and uh, it was yeah it was an awesome opportunity for me oh definitely and I apologize I know I threw a lot at you I, I tend to do that I just keep going instead <laughs> of <laughs> giving you a moment there um, but our, you know just sort of transitioning to going pro I, I mean you get drafted in the seventh round and I, that's of course I, I'd imagine a lot is because of that 2008 season where you showed what you could do in the void that Sean Lee had left but did you have an expectation to get drafted what was that whole process like for you getting ready for the next stage of your life after college yeah so my my junior year was the first year that I started that was 2008 I think I ended the season with like 75 tackles um, which for an every down starter um, and the Big Ten is not too great, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, my goal going into my senior season was to play good enough to be drafted and ultimately have a career in the NFL. So I went into Coach Vanderlinen's office at the end of my junior year in the offseason and said, hey, Coach, here's my dream, here's my aspirations, here are my goals. What do I need to do to put myself in a situation to have an opportunity to play in the NFL? Um, and the biggest thing that he told me was a pro- from production. He said, you need to be more productive than you were your junior year. Just flat. I don't know how else to tell you. You need to be more productive. 
I said, okay, that's, that's something that I can definitely control. And I know the game's going to slow down. And I, I know that I can approach my senior season in a little different manner than I approach my junior season. And that's all things I can control. But what, what does that production look like? What does that mean? Is it tangible? Can we put a number on it? Like, what, what does that mean? Um, he said, yeah. He said, you need to have 10 tackles every single game that you play in. And I'm like, man, this is, that's doable. Like, uh, this, is, this is a goal that is very, very achievable. So going into my senior season, I knew that that's my goal. Ultimately, I had the team goals and things, but um, there was also a little, um, a little selfishness. I think just like if any athlete's going to be honest with you, they're going to tell you that there's a little, little bit of selfishness in them. I wasn't raised that way, but to, to be successful at a high level, you have to have a little Absolutely. bit of that selfishness uh, in, in, your, in your makeup. So I went into my senior season knowing that I wanted to, to have 10 tackles a game and ended up having the, I ended up finishing with 117 tackles and I led the team in tackles my senior year. Um, it was super, super productive in comparison to my junior year. Uh, I knew um, I knew that there was probably an opportunity I could play in the NFL, but I still didn't know whether or not I was going to be drafted. Um, the end of the season, I don't know if you, you guys are probably familiar how this works. Um, the last regular season game in college, um, at least at Penn State, the coaches would go around and hand out envelopes to the senior players, and they were invitations to all-star games. And I can remember sitting in the locker room in our last regular season game, and um, Coach Vandal goes up to Sean and gives him one. I'm like, yeah, that's that's expected. That's awesome. Goes up to Navarre, gives him an envelope. I'm like, man, that's cool. And I'm like, man, there's got to be an envelope for me. Like, I know there's going to be an envelope for me. And he goes around and envelope after envelope, and I still don't have one. I'm getting a little frustrated. And then finally he came up and handed me one. I played in the Texas First Nation All-Star game. Mm-hmm. Um, so went to that, and that was another process. was awesome. I got to work in front of a lot of NFL coaches and scouts and things. Um, and then just the whole um, the whole grading, the whole grading aspect, you the NFL, the scouts, et cetera. I don't even really know who does it, to be honest with you, but your agents give you a grade report on what you can kind of be expected. And mine was seventh round to undrafted. Uh, so I knew that there was maybe a chance I could get drafted. Um, real good likelihood that I wasn't going to be drafted. Um, but just uh, just finished the Texas versus the Nation All-Star, day, All-Star game. I went to New Jersey and trained for nine weeks and then got an invite to go to the Combine and, and, and went from there. Got it. Now – of course, you do go to the Rams. Uh, Steve Spagnuolo is the coach. You know, Josh McDaniels, who ultimately, great career um, ahead of him in Spagnuolo as well. But, I mean, at the time, the Rams didn't have everything they needed, right? Even though there's a lot of good players there, a lot of good coaches, they don't necessarily have the on-field success that you probably had a, on some level got accustomed to at Penn State. What was it about, you know, A, leveling up your game yet again right iron sharpens iron at a new level where you're playing with the best in the world but also how does the team chemistry now differ where it's that without winning there's probably a little bit of a toll on the players emotions and that grind of the season probably just gets a little bit more difficult yeah um so how do I elevate my play again? It was another, uh, another Sean Lee story, but this time it wasn't Sean Lee. This time it was James Laronitis. And it, it boded pretty well for me. <laughs> um, the first day I got, first day I stepped foot at, uh, at the Rams organization, kind of surveying the team. And I knew, I mean, I knew who was there, but I, I really wanted to kind of open my radar up and identify the one or two guys that, really approach it like a consummate pro that did absolutely everything, everything right. Um, from film study to diet, to taking care of your body, to work habit, to ethics, to, I mean, you run a guy, I had a checklist of, of a person I was looking for that kind of fit this bill. And within a week of being there, um, James R. Nice was the guy that fit the bill to a T. Um, and I buddied up with him the same way that I buddied up with Sean, kind of tuck, tucked myself underneath his wing as much as I could. I uh, followed him everywhere he went, um, did everything that he did and, guys used to give me a hard time about it, but I was completely cool with that because I was getting, I had an opportunity to learn from one of the best in the business there as well. So, um, that, uh, I used the same strategy in St. Louis as I did at Penn State and it worked pretty well for me. Yeah, smart, right? yeah, um, smart. the, yeah, the, the chemistry in the locker room, uh, from the college to the NFL level, even without removing winning and losing from it, the, the dynamic is completely different. Uh, there's 53 spots to, available on an active roster and all those 53 guys know that any other any other person in the team in the preseason is trying to take their spot so they're very very apprehensive and reluctant to kind of help you out if you're a rookie who has an opportunity to kind of threaten 
what they've already established. So that, that whole dynamic was something I never really experienced in a college locker room. Um, it's everywhere in the NFL. It's not just in St. Louis. Every team has it. Um, so that, that was kind of – you kind of learn the guys you can trust and you kind of learn the guys that you can't. Um, hold on to the ones that you can trust and kind of just let the ones you can't trust go. I mean, it, it is what it is. It's very, very, very uh, – trans, um, not transparent is not the word, but um, – So trans- that, in, that individualism you were talking about before, about worrying about personal goals in college was more for just your accolades. But now you go to the NFL and now it's amplified a little bit more where guys are really focusing on them, 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 and also the team. But it's more just to stay employed and to stay on a team. It's a livelihood. Um, they have wives, girlfriends, kids, families, et cetera, that they need to provide for at home. And in the college setting, you don't have that. Yeah. Um, so it's that dynamic is different. It's, I love it. Now with, I'm, I'm painting a pretty harsh picture. Um, the camaraderie and stuff in the NFL locker room is insane. Uh, <laughs> the joking around and the pranking and stuff that goes on um, the brotherhood, that is awesome. But there are some nuances to the business side of things that, uh, that aren't, aren't necessarily too pretty. But then you asked about the losing. We, we went through a lot of, uh, a lot of turmoil and a lot of, of strife and grief with not really winning too many games in St. Louis. And that, that is tough um, on the morale in the locker room big time. Um, the one thing that I think that every guy kind of keeps in the back of their mind, yeah, we want to be winning. That's our objective is to win. We want to be Super Bowl contenders. But at the end of the day, we're still getting paid to play our best. So um, at the high school level, I think, kids that aren't as dedicated can kind of check out come right. to losing in the way that yeah. feels and just check out. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the NFL, even the teams that win one, one game a season or don't win any games this season, the guys for the most part are still tuned in because it's at the end of the day, the only thing you have at the N- in the NFL is a signature on your work. And it's so hard to make a team that the last thing you're going to do is go out on a Sunday and not perform at your best. Because if you do that on a, on a consistent basis, you're not going to be performing at all because there's not going to be a place for you. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. And in your defense, we've had a lot of guys come on and paint a very similar picture about the business side of the NFL and how for a lot of guys, not that it necessarily caught them off guard, but on some level, it kind of takes the fun out of the game because it's just different. There's just this new element that has to be considered in for guys. And, uh, you know, I going back to when we had Cedric Benson on, he felt like the business side of it really kind of tarnished his ability to have the NFL career that he wanted. And I'm sure that there's plenty of guys out there that feel on some level the same thing. Um, and I don't, we haven't even talked about the rest of your career. I don't know how you feel necessarily about how your time ends with St. Louis and then going to Washington and the, the sense with the Pats and the Jags. How much do you think that the business side of the NFL got in the way of you being able to really enjoy it which isn't to say that you didn't, but you know, how does the, the, how do you balance that? Just the business with the on field? Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed every single snap in the NFL that I ever took. I think about it every single day and I will probably think about playing football in the NFL every day till I'm no longer here. Um, something that I don't take for granted. Uh, I, I cherish it. I worked very, very hard to get that opportunity. Um, but the business side of the, of uh, the business side of the NFL is real. Um, there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of, um, a lot of excuses that guys can come up with. There's a lot of excuses I can come up with to kind of justify why I'm not playing anymore. Um, I went through that path just like I think almost every other guy that's ever gotten cut in their life has gone down through. I'm out of that now. Um, at the end of the day, now looking back, the business side of things absolutely had something to do, I think, with getting cut from every team. Uh, but at the end of the day, it could have been uh, – I'm not so naive to not – Um, except the fact that maybe I wasn't fast enough anymore. Um, Maybe I wasn't smart enough. Maybe I wasn't strong enough. Maybe I wasn't productive enough. There's a whole checklist of things that that kind of go through your mind to try to figure out why I'm not playing football anymore. And the poor thing about it, um, a lot of guys, me included, you never get that closure because you don't have NFL coaches sit you down and say, hey, son, boom, 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 boom. This is why you got cut. It doesn't happen that way. I got cut in St. Louis, literally sat in a team meeting at the end of the preseason. Coach Fisher congratulated the entire squad on making a 53-man roster. And I'm going down through counting the heads in the squad. And I counted 54. I'm like, you got to – I counted wrong. 52, 53, 54, 54 again. I'm like, okay, now let me go into the linebacker room. I knew we usually keep six or seven linebackers. 
I count six, seven, eight, nine. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So six, seven, eight, nine. I'm like, I think there's one more linebacker than what there should be. And I know there's one more guy in this room than, than, than there is allowed. I'm like, there's a chance. Like, yeah, I'm excited. I just heard Coach Fisher congratulate everybody in the room who made the team. But there's a real legitimate chance that I'm going to be the guy that's cut. Um, we'll go back to the locker room, sit down. Uh, strength coach taps him on the shoulder. I'm like, you got to go talk to Coach Fisher. I'm like, uh, you've got to be kidding me. So that, that's, that's the business side of it right there. I got the taste now. Me, just like I said prior to this, trying to justify it, um, they kept two young rookie linebackers that year. Um, very talented guys. I was going into my fourth season. Um, their salary combined was close to what I was making alone. So that's a way to – maybe it was a two-for-one deal. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. There's, there's all these maybes, and I, I, I try not to fill my mental space with that anymore because there's nothing good that ever comes from it. I did it for – I filled my mind with those questions for two years um, after the NFL was over and it was brutal. It was miserable. Uh, turned me into a person I didn't want to be. And I just kind of try to remove all that negative energy out of my, out of my mind now. So. And, and you know what, I, I want to get to what it's like getting past the negative energy, but to fully take this down to as low as we can before we can take it in another direction. I, I do want to ask because you, you did open up uh, with the trust with part of the NFLPA. And you, know, you talked about, I, I have a quote right here that, you know, this void made you feel angry, frustrated, confused. And I mean, what or how did you sort of take a step back and find a way to get past that? Because uh, you just described that it's not easy to be in this place and how to come to terms with what you're being dealt. But ultimately you did. And how did you do it? How did you sort of just come to accept it and figure out what the next step was. Yeah, that was, um, that was the lowest point in my life. I was 20, I'm trying to think, probably 24, 25 years old. Um, it was the lowest point I've ever been in my entire life. To question my existence, didn't really know what my purpose was anymore. I identified myself as an NFL football player, which is extremely dangerous. Um, <laughs> we are way more than football players at the end of the day. And I did not realize that until my football career was taken away from me. Um, it was a, it's a very, very easy trap to get caught on caught in. And I think a lot of guys do get caught in that. Um, I was fortunately to get out of, I was fortunate to get out of it. Um, the way that I kind of resurrected myself uh, to be completely honest with you was through my wife. Uh, she's my superstar. She's my rock. And I, she, basically stayed beside me this entire process and saw me come home in the evenings just like like I said confused lost angry etc you name it and she never questioned one time why I was behaving and acting the way that I was um she knew exactly why it was and she chose to support me throughout that entire process I'm very very fortunate because there's a lot of guys that marry women while they're playing that don't understand that and when their playing career comes to an end um, we grieve. Um, we grieve the loss of football, just like you would grieve the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wives that don't understand how a man can put that much importance in me. It's not a person that it's your career. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of women that don't understand that. I'm super, super, th super thankful for my wife that she did understand that. Um, and it, it came, it came down to a conversation at the dinner table one night, um, that I wanted, I've always talked about owning my own business and never really knew what exactly it was. I was curious about business, have no business background at all. Um, I have an engineering degree, so I know my way around a cl classroom a little bit. Uh, my wife said, why don't you go back to school uh, and study business? And maybe that could kind of open Pandora's box to your future and open a lot of doors and give you some opportunities that you couldn't even really fathom. I said, you know what? That's a pretty cool idea. So then I made that decision, um, got connected with a trust, and then they helped financially to go back and get my master's in business administration from Penn State University. Uh, and during that process, that's when I kind of realized that all these skills and characteristics that I developed as a professional athlete that I thought were useless when the game was over um, are actually very, very useful and directly applicable to operating, owning, and running your own business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as soon as I kind of made that recollection, um, I had another conversation with a gentleman named uh, David Dupree. He's in my cohort. He's, he's now my co-founder with Content Consulting. So we graduated. Uh, we founded Content Consulting. We help professional athletes become successful business owners. Uh, David and I partnered, and that kind of um, the, or, the origination of 
contend is what rescued me basically from the, from the turmoil and the, and the dark days of no longer having football. Um, I completely filled that void. It gave me objectives to accomplish. It gave me goals to achieve. Um, it, it's, uh, it also, this is something I've just kind of realized just lately that it allows me to stay very, very close to the game of football because I'm dealing with professional football players, which I love. It, it kind of brings a little bit of that camaraderie from the locker room uh, to my, to my off, to my desk every single day while I'm working because I get to interact with these guys on a day-to-day basis. So it's, 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 I can't even begin to express my thanks and gratitude for the trust for giving me the opportunity because it essentially by going through the trust and, and earning my MBA, um, it opened a door to a future that I never would imagine without the help of the trust. That's so awesome. And I know right now somewhere Corey Jackson from Quirks is smiling because I know you're speaking his language yeah. right now. I know he's all about it. Um, it. And it's so cool to hear that, to hit, not that it's rock bottom, but to hit that low point and to be able to bounce back as hard as you have. Um, now we're on the good, right? We're on the positive. So when you look back at it, you know, I, I, I do want to get to contend consulting, but now having gone through that what is your favorite football memory when you just take a step back and look at the whole thing? Is there one thing that sticks out for you? Man, that's a, yeah, that is a very, that's a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, in college, my favorite football memory at Penn state would be, and this is, it's going to sound odd, but it's running literally running out of the tunnel. The first game that I knew that I was going to start, as an inside linebacker. So I made big plays and That's I did I had interceptions. I had sacks. I had double digit tackles. Um, I won the big 10 championship played in a Rose bowl. I mean, the list of the accolades go on and on and on, but the moment it felt so different. Like I ran through the tunnel a thousand, uh, not a thousand times, multiple times before that, knowing that I was going to play, but not as a starting linebacker, man. Then when I ran through there as a starting linebacker, it was a completely different feeling that I'll never, ever forget uh, my entire life. Now the NFL on the NFL side of things, it was uh, it was getting getting the phone call my rookie year saying that I made the 53 man roster. Um, that was a triumph in and of itself for me, a seventh round guy who was always going to be on the cusp, always trying to break it through. That was kind of like um, reassurance, not necessarily reassurance, but I guess maybe it could have been that that it was justification that you are good enough to play in this league. Um, you proved it to 52 other guys. You proved it to an entire coaching staff. Um, go for it it's 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 yours to do whatever you want with it now so it's yeah it was that was that's the two it's kind of probably not the answers you guys were expecting because it's not specific plays but no, it's, it's emotional um yeah emotional emotional things that, that i'll always hold on to you know there might be one or two guys that have ever said a specific play yeah oh, oh really that's cool it's it's games it's it's a feeling it's a certain thing but it's not a play very few guys I, I think once or twice you know there's been like I had a big kick return against my rival you know but more right. often than not it's right down the path of what you're saying so uh, that's very cool. cool no we always like to end on this little ditty called the gauntlet but before we jump into that you know I just wanted to make sure that you get a chance to talk a little bit more about content consulting. Cause I, this is what got you out of that tough time. It's what you're focusing on now. So you've already talked about how you work with athletes. Do you mind just flushing that out a little bit and just talking more about what that is and what you are doing? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, man. It's my, it's my purpose and passion now. So any opportunity I get to plug the plug content consulting, I jump on that. Uh, we, we help professional athletes become successful business owners and that, that service um, that, uh, that objective, I guess, takes three different shapes. Um, it's business development, business redevelopment, and then opportunity evaluation. Um, on the business development side, we take services, ideas, products, concepts, ideas, et cetera, and turn them into bona fide operating businesses. Um, and, and what that looks like, it's literally taking the hand of professional athletes, um, men and women of all sports, not just football, any professional sport, um, we'll take their hand and walk them through every single step that's involved with uh, with starting their business. So it's uh, it's incorporation, um, it's strategic development, it's partnership creation, it's creating formal business plans, uh, it's discussing financing, it's performas, uh, financial projections, literally anything that an entrepreneur is going to come across uh, throughout their entrepreneur career is things that will help these athletes with. Business redevelopment. Uh, is situations where athletes have existing businesses that aren't necessarily performing how they expect them to, or it could be a situation where they've identified a new market. Uh, they're not necessarily 
quite sure how to penetrate it and they need some help um, strategically and figuring out how they want to get into, to get into a new market. So it takes a shape of basically um, consulting any, any other consulting firm that that's our consulting practices. We're going in uh, do a complete strategic shakedown. Um, we'll look at the value chain. Uh, we'll look at process analysis uh, and basically make strategic recommendations on how to increase their top line, their bottom line. Uh, and then we make sure we, we develop strategic um, plans and initiatives to tackle the new markets, et cetera. And then the third, the third service is opportunity evaluation where we've developed a, a proprietary system. It's called the true match system that evaluates investments on five different levels. And then we also evaluate our athletes on the same five levels and we'll cross correlate that evaluation to determine whether or not uh, a financial investment makes sense for the specific athlete that we're working with. Um, if it doesn't make sense, then we'll, we offer suggestions and advice on how to improve uh, improve the opportunity to make it a little bit more viable for them. Very cool. Uh, I yeah. think that MBA definitely opened up some doors, huh? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as alluded to, we have the gauntlet. So, Josh, I know we're running a little over here. Let me just hit you with a couple quick fire questions. You got to let me know what's your knee jerk reaction. What's most yeah. important? The number one offense or number one defense? Number one defense. All right. As a linebacker now, you could only be in the 3-4 or the 4-3. Which one are you taking and what position are you playing? 4-3, <laughs> inside linebacker. I had a feeling that one was coming. Yes, sir. Now, was there ever one player or one coach that you just wish you had the chance to play with? Um, boy, this is supposed to be rapid fire. Um. <laughs> You guys got me here. This is a, this is a little embarrassing. Hey, mm -hmm. if, you, if you had a fulfilled career and there's nothing that jumps out to you, then maybe there is no answer. I got one for you. Brian Urlacher. I would have liked to play beside Brian Urlacher. Mm -hmm. That would have been nice. That would have just completed, you know, the, the trilogy of, of you being able to get, you know, up and close with some of the best to ever do it. Right. <laughs> um, now, what's most important? Is it the players or is it the scheme? Players. All day. Players. And what I love to end on now is what's the best piece of advice that you could give to someone, particularly a 17, 18 year old kid that looks up and is like, wow, I, I want to be the next Josh Hall. Yeah. Um, I would tell a 17 or 18 year old kid to set their sights extremely high. Um, never, never convince yourself that you're not capable of achieving something that others tell you that you're not able to achieve. Um, if I would have, have listened to that, I would end up playing at Bucknell and absolutely would have never had the opportunity to play in the NFL. Um, so, yeah, set your sights high and, and do everything in your own power to, uh, to accomplish the, the goals and objectives that you set forth. Awesome. Yeah. Now, Josh, lastly now, where can everyone find you on social media, websites, anywhere that you want to direct our audience to follow you? My social media game is weak right now. That's something that uh, David and I need to work on with, with Contend. But the best place to find me is at LinkedIn. Um, Josh Hall is my personal profile. And Contend, Contend Consulting LLC um, has, a, has a web page as well on LinkedIn. Um, our, our email address for Contend is www.contend.com. And I'll also throw my email address out there if anybody wants to reach out to me to have a discussion a little bit more further detail it's josh at the content team.com uh, feel free to to reach out i love interacting connecting with as many professional athletes as i can on a day-to-day -day basis there's there's always something to be learned from from talking to uh, to an athlete that plays a different sport or even even the guys that uh, that play in the nfl um everybody has a unique story and there's always something that i take uh, take away from this conversation so i welcome them with open arms very cool well josh thank you so much for taking the time man we really appreciate it yes thank you josh mm -hmm. My pleasure, gentlemen. It was, uh, it was an honor to be on the show. I appreciate it.